coming. Um, two of my, whoops, uh, let's start the, oh my gosh, sorry. Let's start, oh my gosh, okay. It's, um, the resolution is kind of terrible. I think I can get it started though. Here we are. All right, thank you all again for coming. Uh, two of my co-authors are here in the audience with me, Anisha Peters and Charles Hill. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so um, the question that we've been interested in trying to address for a number of years is whether software supports a variety of smart users. And the quick answer is no, not really. It tends to support some kinds of smart users and a whole lot of other smart users aren't so very well supported. So um, today's field study tells you about how four software teams in the field, without us telling them what to do, used a new process that we've devised called GenderMag, it's a method, to find gender inclusiveness issues in their own software. So we'll tell you about their adventures. So what's GenderMag? Well, it's a method. It stands for Gender Inclusiveness Magnifier, so there's a little magnifying glass right there to help you remember that. Um, its purpose is to evaluate tools inclusiveness with, by people who don't have any kind of background in gender differences or uh, even necessarily in, in any kind of UX work. So even software developers are, we hope, able to use it. Um, the scope that GenderMag helps you address is when the software is intended for some form of problem solving. So um, imagine a user trying to solve a problem and coming to the computer to, to work on it, on some sort of problem. A classic example is debugging tools, decision support software, spreadsheets, anything where the user is thinking and thinking and thinking, trying to figure something out, and they're, in, they're, they're using software as part of that process. That's the scope that we intended GenderMag for. We've since found out that there's one other um, kind of problem-solving software that it also works on. That's when the user is sitting there trying to solve a problem, not one they brought to the computer, but one that actually arose because they're just trying to use the software and they have to problem solve to do it. So it turns out GenderMag's pretty good at finding issues that happen that way too. It's in beta, okay? Uh, this is a continually evolving method. In fact, I just uploaded a new downloadable version this morning. So uh, we, we updated about every two to three months. Um, GenderMag, so that's what uh, it's about what it has is personas. It has um, four personas, and their whole job is to bring to life five gender inclusiveness facets. And you'll get to know a little bit of one of the personas and a little bit of a couple of the facets shortly. Um, it brings all those things together with a gender specialized cognitive walkthrough, which its whole job is to is basically to marry the thing into a process. So here's just a little bit about one of the personas. This is Abby. This is what Abby looks like, at least in this persona. But Abby has alternative appearances as well. Abby can also look like this older woman, this, this man, or this younger student. Abby's job is to present uh, a set of, of facet values. And so one of the facets is risk. And so Abby's version of risk is that she is risk averse with new software features. This is risk averse in that kind of situation. She's worried not because she's afraid that she is going to bite her or something, but she's just worried about wasting her time. So her time is very valuable to her, and she doesn't want to spend time and then not get any benefits from it. So as a result, whenever she has a task that she can form, perform some more familiar way uh, than using some fancy new feature, then she will. So um, where did we get this? Uh, well, there are these five facets, and they all have different values. Uh, and um, these values are all backed by extensive empirical and theoretical work. And so what we did is we chose facets that were backed by at least five independent empirical studies. So I'm just going to show you a little bit of one study of one facet, just so you can get the general idea. So this one was about risk aversion. 
And so you can see that, well, they were kind of, it was Likert scale stuff. And so you can see that these people, all of these people, are pretty risk tolerant when it comes to technology kind of issues. And these people over here are pretty risk averse, and these people are in the middle. So the first thing to notice about that is that there's quite a bit of overlap, ways in which the female answers, which I've shown in pink, and the male answers, which I've shown in blue, um, are, are overlapped. So in, those people are pretty much like each other. The second thing to notice is that the distributions of these are very different. That's why it matters for us to think about some facet values that are um, disproportionately um, used more uh, by, by people who identify as male than by people who identify as female and vice versa because these distributions tend to be different. So the persona's job is to look out for the interests of these people. So Tim's job, he's one of our personas, is to look out for all the people that are like this, for their interests. And Abby's job is to look out for the interests of people like this. And then the Pats, who are actually identical twins, uh, by this I mean identical in everything except their pictures, these, their, their job is to look out for the rest of them. So let's just look at that black line that I've drawn there. Imagine that there was software that had been built in such a way that it was really only supportive of people to the left of that line, okay? Well, it turns out there is a lot of software like that because it turns out that a lot of the people who are building that software or have built it historically have had a lot of facets in common with this persona. In any case, if there's software like that, what this says is roughly 75% of the females are not being very well supported, at least on the risk spectrum, and also about half of the males. Okay? So anything that we do to increase the support of people who have these facet values helps everybody, okay? but it, it also helps to level the playing field on gender inclusiveness. All right, so the other thing I mentioned is that we have a gender-specialized cognitive walkthrough. You may have been familiar with standard cognitive walkthroughs. The black print is pretty much a standard cognitive walkthrough. What we added were just a few minor things. The first is you choose a persona when you do a gender mag session, and so if the team chose Abby, then it would say, will Abby have formed this goal? This is to really help you connect with the persona that you are trying to represent. The second thing is we added a maybe, so for all of the answers to these questions, you can answer not only yes or no, but it encourages you to, ask, to answer maybe. Why? Because gender mag is all about inclusiveness. So we want to include the perspectives of everyone sitting at the table, not just the person who can shout the route the most and, and get everybody to come around and agree. The third thing is we make people say why. Uh, so why they made whatever decision they made, and it ties, it, it points them back to particular sections of those personas exactly where the facet values are to really keep them connected, not only with the personas, but to particular places in the personas that, what, that are what the personas are trying to bring out. So uh, this is just one example of how somebody noticed an issue that Abby was supposed to do something. They decided, no, Abby would not do that. And their reason why was because Abby, one of her facet values, says she doesn't like to learn by tinkering. She likes other ways of learning. She's more process-oriented. And so uh, what, what this male said was Abby is disinclined to push and poke, and so she's not going to discover that. So that's how they used the facets. Okay, so... Um, Let's, uh, let's take a look briefly at our methodology. And so uh, we had four teams uh, scattered among three agencies. And we had a, a variety of people on these teams. And they were doing the evaluation work, not us. We were just paying attention. So one had both males and females. Another one had just males and so on and so forth. Their job titles, there were software developers on all of the teams. And some of them also had managers and UX people. They used um, mostly Abby, but one team also used Tim uh, as personas. The software domains were very different, ranging from travel to a mobile app. Uh, the software lifecycle was also very different, ranging from 10 years old to pre-release, and all of these uh, were, were still uh, active. And the envisioned operator or users of the software were also very different. So <clears throat> to the results, what did they find? Well, the point of this method is gender inclusiveness issues. And I was really kind of blown away when I saw these results. These people 
evaluating their own software by themselves with no background in gender differences uh, in evaluating, they found gender inclusiveness issues in 25% of the features they evaluated. That's one out of four. Some of the software is 10 years old and still out there. One out of four, okay? I was really surprised. Okay, so what's a gender inclusiveness issue? We defined it as one that they found using the facet value. So for example, if they found something and said, well, you know, anybody who's risk averse is gonna have trouble with that and that's the way Abby is, so she's gonna have trouble. What that's saying is that software, that, that issue is going to disproportionately affect the Abbeys of the world. And similarly on the Tim side, if they found things uh, that related to Tim's facet values. So that was the definition of a facet, of an inclusiveness issue. Here's one example. Abby was supposed to enter a tag. They decided she wouldn't do it. And, and one of the participants said, how would Abby know? She prefers step by step. And another one said, she doesn't like to tinker. She's risk averse. Okay, she's not going to do that. Okay, so 25%, they also used the method to find another 30% on average of just kind of generic usability issues and, um, you know, like the font's too small and that sort of thing. So uh, in total, 55% of the features, features they evaluated, they found something. So um, we have a lot of rich results and we don't have time to talk about a whole lot of them. So I'm going to just tell you a few uh, of the kind of interesting bits. Um, for Agency G, the first team, uh, the one that found only 14%, well, they were the first to use gender mag. And furthermore, they weren't very excited about it. The boss told them to do it, so they came. The boss couldn't come, though. Uh, so there they were, trotting along because the boss told them to. Furthermore, they didn't really have very much empathy for Abby. Uh, as one of the participants said, I don't really have very much experience with the operators. So, okay, fine. And Gender Mag was at its roughest state because they were the first team to use it. So we had lots of, lots of bumps there. Um, the second team uh, had heard about the first team's experience, but they'd found out the outcome, which you're about to find out too, and um, they were eager to come. And I think one of the reasons they were so eager is that they really, really identified Abby as being a lot like their operators that use the software. As one of them said, our, major our users are majority female, risk averse, few tinkers, and they pretty much described Abby to a T when they were describing their population. So how'd it go? Well, so GB, they were the ones that weren't that excited in the first place, and they left with kind of the same expression, uh, impression, like, okay, fine, that was fun. And then they told the boss how their session had gone. And at some point, they described an issue, a gender inclusiveness issue they had uncovered, and the boss said, I've seen this with our operators. And that was very um, convincing to them. And suddenly, they started to really get excited about the value they could get uh, in advance. GS started out excited, stayed excited. Um, they both used the facets pretty well. In fact, risk and tinkering were the most common. And perhaps the most, the most important thing is they realized that really it's all about the facets. It's not really about gender. It's all about the facet values and being inclusive across the range of facet values. And they discovered it. They said it really wasn't about the gender, was it? It's about her facet values. Company E, uh, a, team male, a female teammate recruited it, then they couldn't attend, they arrived unprepared, sounds like a recipe for disaster, but actually it wasn't. They, they quickly, even though they hadn't prepared, they quickly turned themselves around and, um, and began to embrace Abby. This was machine learning software, and they started out saying, Okay, you know, we're gonna, it's not an accountant, but they fixed that, and then they said, she's a bit curious, but not too curious, and that's good. I like her. The other guy says, I am channeling Abby, and actually the end of his quote was, and I do not like this software. He's talking about his own software. He <laughs> um, um, also discovered without our help that the facets, it was all about the facets. They said, it's not about gender, is it? It's people differences. And it revealed things they'd never noticed before. In fact, they said, once you use this, it makes it easy to detect these things. It entered into their intuition. Two weeks later, they'd fixed three of the issues that they found. W, by now we have a pattern, was a little ambivalent about trying it. Uh, but one teammate championed it. And by the time uh, they had the session, 11 people showed up. It was too many for the room. They had to kick some of them out. Ultimately, they did four sessions. 
with uh, three of which they did with Abby and one with Tim. They found inclusiveness issues from both perspectives, but they found more with Abby than with Tim. One of the things they said is, well, we're, we're all a bunch of Tims, so of course it was a better fit for the Tims. Okay, that means stop. Uh, okay, wait, 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 I have to say this. Okay, um, after a few weeks, um, we checked back. And it turns out Team W didn't own the software, so they didn't get to make changes. And so they had to rant and rave and get somebody else to make changes, but they did. They believed, they kept going, they got them fixed. Five months later, it had spread among some of their little spin-off labs. Ten months later, they're looking at wide, company-wide usage and just starting to explore that possibility. So there's a bunch of triangulation, which I won't tell you about. In conclusion, this is the first field investigation of software practitioners, ordinary software practitioners, using a systematic method to find gender inclusiveness issues in software, because if you can't find them, you can't fix them. Our results, as you've seen, are one out of four of their features had gender inclusiveness issues that they found. I think a nice way to word this is a quote I stole from Ashcraft and, and Dubot, in which they said, women in technology do not generally need extra help, but the software in which they work does need help. So I hope you download it. I hope you try it. I hope you teach with it. Uh, feel free to talk to me, because I think that it takes a village to really change things. And I'm on a, on a mission right now to change the world. And so I hope you help me. Questions? Thank you for your presentation. I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more on the other facets that you include in Gender Mag, mm -hmm. and specifically if you could also address the base of evidence that you use um, and whether or not the evidence is with people of different genders and usability in uh, online and software spaces or if it's in other just offline real life contexts. Seems like that would make a difference. Okay, Thank so you. that's a big question. The first one was uh, what are the facets and the second one was what was the evidence. So first jumping to the bottom line, we have all of our foundation documents online for these personas and so if you go to our webpage you'll be able to read it all for yourself. Um, the, the studies were not all done by me, in fact I, I think that's a, a feature, not a bug. Um, and so, um, but every facet is backed by at least five studies. Some of them actually have 10 or 15. Um, the majority of the studies tend to favor U.S. populations, but certainly not all of them. Um, we have excluded children from our, our claims of it being the target. So all the studies that we've used to base this on are adults. Um, from all different walks of life and all different kinds of studies, you know, surveys and lab studies and, and field studies and, and um, everything. Um, so I, oh, and the other facets, uh, besides risk aversion, there's way of learning technology, there's information processing style and a, a couple more. So these are all cognitive problem solving oriented things. I really need study. Um, I was interested in the people who kind of championed this as you know a technique and, and bring people in. Were there certain things that you saw were more common, you know, characteristics of those champions for this method? You know, um, that's a really great question. There seemed to be about three reasons why people champion it. Uh, one of them is just passion for the whole idea of diversity. So we've seen it about that. Another is a feeling that the method speaks to them, and it's like, you know, they're in the room, they see it, and they feel like, finally, somebody is representing me, and then it's safe, too, because in the past, they may have been sitting in the room, all the other people kind of liked some feature, they didn't, but they thought, oh, it's just me, I'm not going to talk about it, but now they don't have to talk about it. They can just say, Abby does not like that. There is no way Abby's going to do it. So it seems like it makes things safe, and this, this gets them excited. Um, the third thing is if, if, it's, if they're in a position where they're trying to target a population that includes a lot of Abbeys, and they realize that they're not reaching them and they have no idea why, so that business case, that lights a fire too. So that, that's what I've seen. All right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Margaret. Thank you.